Today is February 6th, 2018, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 76. Today on Human Factors Cast, we're talking about virtual air traffic control towers, AI predicting late flights, real-time mixed VR, and more. You better think twice about where you take your fitness tracker. Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. You know what, Blake? All things considered, I think I think I made it through that intro pretty solidly. <laughs> I got to say, for like as sick as you sound, that intro was spot on. <laughs> so our listeners may notice that we are recording a day late. Yesterday, I just I could not speak. Uh, it was nigh impossible. And today, uh, as you can probably tell by listening to the podcast, it's not much better. But I'm going to try to make the best of it. I'm going to try to get through this episode. It's going to be a little shorter. I'm just warning you. We just want to make sure we get something out there so we can talk about it and facilitate the conversation. But in case you're brand new to the show, welcome to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, and joined to me, joined with me, by, as always, I'm sick. It's Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, man. Well, congrats to everybody for making it to the sick episode of the week. <laughs> but, man, I'm glad that we're still able to be here. We will keep it short, like Nick said. Uh, but, uh, Nick, I'm glad to, glad to hear you, glad to have you here, all that kind of good stuff. What has been going on? Okay, so, okay. I was going to report on the Nintendo Switch last week because I purchased it for my birthday. I finally took the dive. And in the past, I had been really critical about this thing, right? This... This, uh, if you're unfamiliar, the Nintendo Switch is this gaming console, and the the big sort of uh, gimmick, I guess, with it is that you can not only play it on your TV screen, but you can dock the controllers on the sides of it and pick it up out of the dock and uh, play it portably as well. Um, now, I, I I have a couple points I want to make. This thing is uh, in the past. Some of my criticisms have been it's an ergonomic nightmare. Uh, it it they did not take design into consideration when they wanted to say, you know, if you're if you're playing the charging ports on the bottom, so you can't charge it and play it at the same time, unless you're hand, holding it in your hands, which is uncomfortable to me. Anyway, all that still holds true. Uh, but damn it, Blake, Super Mario Odyssey is super fun. So there's that. <laughs> so okay do do all those like ergonomic issues and like the docking problems still hold true for you and you're just having a good like gaming experience or since purchasing it and actually getting it in your hands have, have you like kind of changed your mind about any of that stuff you're you didn't like before you know okay so uh, let me let me tackle a couple things here so the ergonomic nightmare part of it yes it's still an ergonomic nightmare so let me paint the picture for you blake if you want to play uh if you want to play on the screen, what you have to do is you have to dock this thing, right? You dock it, and then you press two buttons on the back side of your controllers and slide the controllers off the side without pulling the actual tablet piece out of the dock. Okay, and then you have to sync the controllers. So you sync the controllers with the shoulder buttons. Okay, now that's that's all well and good. But if you want to play in like a actual controller mode, you have to slide both of these joy cons, they call them, into this sort of uh, this contraption that sort of molds them into a, a controller uh, as, as you might be familiar with it. Now, as if that wasn't bad enough, these joy cons, they are cool technology. They are really cool and they actually feel not bad in my hands. Um, I actually prefer to play with them detached and sort of free roaming and because i've been sick i haven't really had a chance to test this yet but i I bought the switch so that i can play this while i'm in the gym right and i can have my hands free walking on the treadmill side you know with the controllers at the side uh i have not tried it yet because like i said i've been sick um but that being said uh that's kind of how i like playing right now um there's a lot of moving pieces man there's there's really a lot of moving pieces with this because you got the you got the joy cons you got the tablet you got the dock you got the little controller piece that you can put it into and if you want to play two player yeah the joy cons um you can use the joy cons as their own little controller 
Uh, but then you got to slide on this attachment on the top that allows you to press the bumpers on it. And I just don't understand. It's, it's a lot. Um, yes. Yeah, if you like, I swear, if we go back and listen to the intro you gave about kind of just docking and then moving the controllers and the buttons you had to press, like it just sounds really complicated. And I've, I've never even like put one in my own hands. I would be hesitant to think that I'd be able to do it all right on the first try or not like oh, pull yeah. the tablet out from the uh, the docking station or something if I need to get the controllers off of it. So I, 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 I think your f- initial assessment of like the ergonomic problem still definitely holds true just from your experience. Yeah, I definitely got to say though, um, like I did not get it right on the first try. I probably broke my Joy-Cons in some capacity from, you know, not clicking the right button and forcing out the Joy-Con. Like it's just not that intuitive to me. Um but, I mean, that being said, they got some really great games on it. And I got to say, uh, one of my, this is, this is uh, one of my favorite parts, man. I'm going to be totally honest. When I'm sick, you know, I'm spending a lot of time on the toilet. <laughs> so, so I go up to the dock, dock my Joy-Cons, pick the thing up, and I sit on the toilet. And there you go. I'm spending some quality time with my Switch. And I don't have to, like, wait until I get off the toilet to go play some more. It's pretty great. See, there you go. They should just do a commercial with Nick. I'm they, telling you, Nintendo, no, Human they, Factors Cast, right here. They even put that in their marketing. They have some guy on the toilet playing because they know that's how <laughs> you're gonna play. Like, I'm not even making this up. Go look at the Super Bowl ad from last year. They they have it. So, anyway, oh, epic. <laughs> what's going on with you, Blake? Oh man. Okay. So over the weekend, I went on a pretty sick cab- cabin trip with a bunch of friends that I hadn't seen in a very long time, and. Per usual, we went on a hike that I was not able to do as well. And so now my leg actually won't bend. Um, and this is like related to some IT band problems that I've always kind of had with one of my particular legs. But it's it's always funny to me, Nick, when whenever I get some kind of injury, especially if it has to do with like a foot or a knee or any part of your leg, it's crazy to me how interconnected your body is and how much you depend on on both legs to even walk and i mean uh, throughout a lot of the um actually a lot of the super bowl ads there was a lot of ads for some of the athletes to compete in the winter olympic games and there were some people that either didn't have arms or didn't have legs and it was it's just been a, a crazy thing of me just trying to get around and walk around with only one leg being unable to bend my knee and how much that just impacts my day to day, much less if I didn't always have the appendage. Uh, so it's just been a strange lesson for me in biomechanics for the past couple of days, man. Well, I gotta say, uh, you know, I, I, I know those lessons of biomechanics cause we talked about it on the show a couple weeks ago with my cat and, uh, yeah, it really is impressive how, how many moving parts there are to the body and then what, sort of is required to make yourself move yeah like even something simple as trying to like let's say lift a leg that doesn't really want to function right now like it requires so many other muscles that i haven't used on their own and with basically my one leg being kind of like dead weight at this point like it's it's really difficult it can be super painful because i'm not very strong and things like that so yeah it's it's crazy how much you're able to get by on a day-to-day basis, but still there's there's so many incon- interconnected parts that you may not be using optimally and things like that. So it's been it's been kind of funny, painful, but kind of funny to like think about all of that and really get to admire just the uh <laughs> the ana- my, my own anatomy. Yeah, I I'm uh I'm imagining a poor Blake Arnsdorf just walking hobbling down the street uh with with his one leg, one good leg and uh uh, yeah, a couple it's pretty, of crutches. It's pretty funny to watch. I won't lie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well uh, hey, do you want to bump that thing today, or do you want to wait? I meant to ask uh, you. We can, we can wait. Do you want to shout out some of these people for uh, yeah. Slack? Yeah, I do. I want to I wanna say welcome to our member, new members in our Slack channel. We got Joe, Mateo, Rachel, Ben, Brittany, and just today we had a couple other, uh, a couple other ones. We have uh, Joseph and Haley. So welcome, guys, to the Human Factors class the human factors cast slack uh we are discussing human factors and non-human factor stuff in there uh it's a great conversation uh place to go and talk with other people in the field so if you guys want to join up our listeners you're more than welcome to our link we put those in the show notes we have them on our website i think it's on our twitter too you can pretty much uh find them anywhere or you can send us an email we'll send it to you directly uh because we always want more conversation in there um 
But uh, I don't know, Blake, did you want to talk about this? Because we'll get into the Strava story a little bit later. Maybe we can pull it in then. Yeah, let's do that. Let's All just right. uh, save it for later. All right. So, well, before before we get a two ahead of ourselves, let's go ahead and get into Human Factors News. Now, this is a part of the show all about Human Factors News. It's where we talk about everything related to the field of Human Factors. This could be anything from medical, psychology, AI, VR, automation, whatever it is. As long as it relates to the field of Human Factors, it is fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right, so first we're talking a little bit about air traffic control. So in London's cramped city airport, it's actually located in the heart of the city and is undergoing a massive upgrade, including the addition of a new air traffic control tower. To maximize the airport's limited space, that tower is actually being built a total of 80 miles away and relies on 14 high-definition cameras to give remote air traffic control crews a virtual view of the far-off airport. These virtual screens offer some unique advantages like augmented overlays showing radar tags and call signs tagged to each plane as they move across these screens. Further, if the entire system was to fail, the ATC crew can fall back to radar and voice communications, which is what they already use if, if when fog limits some of the visibility. Now, Nick, I did a fair amount of research when I was in undergrad, or no, in grad school about air traffic control and some of the newer interfaces, but I had not realized how many different large airports like this particular one in London actually have these virtual off location ATC towers. So this is this is not new. It's not totally a new concept, no. I mean the article mentions that, but I hadn't really thought of it that way. Um, and when you, I guess when when you break it down, it doesn't necessarily need to be on the runway with the aircraft because of, like it says in the in the tail end of that little blurb, I mean a lot of the backup ways of communicating with air, airplanes is radar and voice communication anyhow. Yeah, I mean Look, this kind of this is kind of like a simplified version of telepresence almost where you are virtually being teleported to the airport to, you know, be able to see these uh these airplanes taking off and landing and presumably all the sensor data is coming directly from the airport. So for all intents and purposes, you are there virtually. Uh you are just located 80 miles away. And so <laughs> I I think this is a really cool example of not only a virtual environment, but a complex human factors problem that um, is accomplished by using one. And, and to me, this is a cool story only because uh, you don't need to be in the place that the, the whole telepresence thing, right? You don't need to be in the place for something so critical as this too. I mean, think about these guys, these guys in the air traffic control, they are critical to, um, making sure that the the safety of the passengers and the pilots are taken into account with um, all these planes coming in and off these runways and what happens I don't, I don't know you know where these guys park I'm sure they have some sort of dedicated spot but not having to deal with the traffic to get to the airport to deal with all that uh, can you imagine what would happen if one of these guys are late I mean I I'd imagine there's some sort of uh, handover but even so this just gives it one more uh this is one more reason uh why it it for me i don't know it should be located off site yeah it's it's kind of interesting looking back now at just some of the graphics from the actual article and you know i i don't know why i didn't really think of this it it's totally feasible for i, I would think most air traffic control towers to be located off site because so much of the work is done through the radar scope or through the basically the ui that you give an atc to to make changes and for planes whether it's handoffs or changing their altitude they're looking at a screen that's not at all like looking at the runway or any of that kind of stuff so i i I think it just makes a whole lot of sense in fact i'm not even as sure because i'm i'm assuming what it's meaning by it's augmenting overlays from like the radar and putting call call sign tags on airplanes is maybe if you're watching takeoff or landing or if you can see terminal airplanes, it's actually, I guess, showing you those call signs. But typically, I don't know if you would even really need to see like what these high def cameras are actually showing. Right. I think it's just more of a, uh, a sense of presence. Uh, so, I mean, it feels like they're there. I don't know. Yeah, because you bring up a good point. Yeah, do they need to see all this? Because they do have all this sensor data. Um, 
you know, right in front of them on, on geo displays. And is this more, more or less just an excuse to sort of, um, show them what's, what's going on, give them something to look at? I think honestly what it could be, and I've, I've kind of fallen out of remembering how all the operations work in the tower, but usually you have your at work ATCs at the stations, but you'll also have, I guess, kind of your, your, supervisor that's walking the floor and they'll typically they typically will be kind of monitoring what's going on outside as well as like checking on any specific problems people have so maybe it's mainly for that specific role um but i think as far as just a straight up atc you're usually not going to have too many instances where you're going to be you know it like kind of like with a plane you're not gonna be looking visually to figure out what's going on you're gonna be going by your instruments um, or these geo displays yeah and you know another thing that could be potentially in the future is is if they have they have these cameras i see on this video that they have some sort of overlays uh it looks like just uh i can't even tell it looks like 180 divided by 5 eg lc and then triple zero divided by zero do you know what any of that is like it, it, um yeah i'm waiting for the gift to come back around yeah you see it too all right so i i don't know what that is but I mean, that to me implies that there is some potential for, um, even in the future, some sort of augmented display where you have, uh, very much like, uh, that football thing was this Sunday, right? And they have the, the Super Bowl thing. I'm not a sports guy. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but they, <laughs> they have these really cool technologies where they augment your screen with who's running and where and where the line is and, Oh, um, yeah, when you're able to kind of, like, draw on the screen and rewatch <clears throat> plays, that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, if they even had, like, the players or the planes here, like, what flight, what's their destination, uh, and, like, just kind of tags on the 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 screen there, it could be a welcome addition. I don't know if they need that. It could be good for, like you said, the manager, the supervisor, who needs that sort of situation awareness of what's going on um, but can't be down in the nitty-gritty uh, organizing everything. Yeah, I could see it being like a good idea if, let's say, you're having kind of an issue that's that's happening so close that you can't. You, maybe on your screen, it's not as evident. If that makes any sense, like let's say you've got a plane landing and taking off, and based on what's going on in your radar scope, it's not as evident that this is about to be a real, real big issue. Although with so right. much automation that's baked into those tools now. I hardly see that as a problem, but I mean, there's got to be some kind of reasoning behind it. Um, and and I, I like the the thought you're having here of kind of adding some of these augmented tools onto the screen, and maybe it could even be a way, like if especially if you're able to like see highway in the sky style. Oh yeah, um, now we're talking. To, yeah, being able to really like map out problems because usually with degrees of separation and air traffic control, you have enough time to kind of figure out like, okay, this is what can be done and maybe it could be a problem solving tool. I'm not really sure, but there's got to be some some good use to it. Yeah, well, uh, why don't you go ahead and read the next story? And since my voice is so froggy, I'm going to reduce my bass here and see if that helps a little bit. How about that? How does that sound? Oh, it's gorgeous. Is it is it better? Does it Do I sound less sick? Uh, you said, yeah, less sick. Less sick. All right, let's go with that. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? So keeping in line with some of the flight, uh, flight news this week. So flight delay alerts are definitely helpful, but they usually depend on airlines notifying you in a timely fashion. And they're not always quick on the draw, as I'm sure most of us are aware. However, Google Flights has been updated to not only explain the reasons for delays, but also predict them. The upgrade uses a machine learning system incorporating historic flight status information to forecast delays and flags them when there's at least an 80% co- 80% confidence prediction that it will come true. The company stresses that you should still show up on time because you don't want to miss a flight due to just your own pessimism, but this could give you a hint of trouble before you set foot in the airport. And Nick, I'm not sure how many times you've experienced this, but I have definitely come across this, especially in international travel, where I'll get, you know, delayed flight information the second that I'm standing in the terminal as a text, oh, where I could have had it a couple hours before and maybe not be sitting in the airport for a bunch of hours. Uh, so this is a really cool addition, but I'm I'm so impressed by the 
idea that it's drawing on historical data to like give you a much better confidence interval for, okay, we might have a flight delay based on these issues we've seen in the past. I just think that's mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, it's really impressive with what AI is accomplishing now. And in fact, it's scary in some cases, but I, I mean, this, uh, this is another example of how this is going to, uh, AI is going to improve the way that we sort of uh, interact with these apps and these these alerts that we sort of set up on our mobile devices. And you're absolutely right. I mean, I've been in that situation before where I'm like, oh, well, it, my flight just kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed because of weather. And it ended up to the point where I had to wait 24 hours to get on a flight. So if I had something like this that said, hey, you know what? It's probably just not going to happen at all. Like all of these flights that you are potentially thinking about are not going to happen. Um, it's such a weird sort of uh, area, though, because you, you have to think about it from the standpoint of you don't want to misinform the person who is looking at your app. You don't want to say it has an 80% likelihood of being canceled. Well, you know what? If it's that high, like, what is your threshold? For you, Blake, I'm, I'm asking you personally, like, what would your threshold be if you looked at this app and it said, hey, your flight is, is uh, has an 80% chance of being canceled? Wh what's that number for you where you would just say, all right, well, I'm just going to stay home and rebook it tomorrow or rebook it later? Yeah, man, that's that's a really tough one because I don't know that I would stay home unless I knew like I got some notes that said it was going to be canceled because the problem is, is even if this thing is 80 percent right, if you get to the airport and it takes off, you're you're losing money yeah. um, for a flight that you've already booked. And because this isn't necessarily interacting at this point, interacting with specific airlines like it, you know, kind of in tandem, like Google and Formula, and like, hey, based on what we're seeing here, you're likely going to have to cancel this flight. It's it's more of like in a third party position. I would right. still be the guy at the airport, no matter what Google is telling me, uh, trying to tell the the person at the front desk, like, hey, I'm pretty sure this flight's going to be canceled. Can I go ahead and book book another one? Um, but yeah, I don't. I honestly think I would probably still be there because I I wouldn't want to lose out on the cash I'd spent. How about you, Nick? Yeah, see, that's me too. I would show up, and if it's canceled, it's canceled. I go home and or rebook for another time. Um, but like, I'm trying to understand. With that being said, are there people out there who will look at this go and this eighty percent confidence rating and be okay? Well, uh, yeah, I'm just not gonna. I'm going to book it with another another time or something like is there is there that person out there who just wants to mitigate their uh chances of getting delayed um and what if if not I I mean I can't I, I can imagine some people out there would but for the vast majority I would imagine are like us Blake where we show up and and we're just our little sheeps and we you know get to the airport and if it's delayed then we rebook and if not then great um, but what kind of value does this, does this type of thing offer to people like us where we are, I don't know, does it like prepare, like, cause in, in my mind, it prepares me mentally for, okay, yeah, this might get delayed, but on the off chance it doesn't, great. Um, and... I I kind of think one place this might help is over time because, you know, as this data grows and there's more historic flight information, the more accurate it would likely get. And if it was potentially able to give you this kind of reading farther out to where, let's say I got a notification from Google Flight that this flight might be delayed enough ahead of time that if I canceled it and booked another one, I could still get some amount of refund back based on airline policies. I could see it being useful then. Um, once it has enough information kind of within its own database to make decisions off of. I think it already has that, man. It has like years of flight data. Um, I, I agree that as, as time goes on, they'll only get more accurate. Uh, but they have all, all the weather data. Um, they have all the flight data. They have um, cancellation. They have uh, what other things do they have that are... Uh, events that are happening in a city like they have a lot of data that they can tie together for this thing and i i don't doubt that uh, and especially since they're using ai for this i don't doubt that um 
you know, it'll get better and better. It's just, what does it provide to us? Like, I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Besides the, the frustration that, oh man, my flight's going to be right. I, I, delayed like, or canceled. <clears throat> the only thing I can, I can think of that can kind of justify this is, well, I'm going to mentally prepare now in my head. I, I, and kind of that anticipation of, this is probably going to get canceled. So here are the steps that I have to go through. And maybe if it offered like, here's steps that you have to go through to get a new flight, like, you know, talk to this person or click a button and we'll reschedule for you. Like that might be a useful tool, but just the, just the raw stat alone, this is, this flight is probably going to get canceled. I don't know, man. Well, again, you're bringing it into a better point. I think is that this could be integrated into like uh, let's say like a united united system or their application something like that to work in tandem with actual airlines to potentially help them you know have solutions to okay we're looks like we're potentially gonna have to cancel this flight or have enough foresight and then you know hooking together like okay so you're likely to have this flight canceled here's some extra options for you so i think right. it's down the road we're gonna see the benefit but for right now it's like yeah okay I can mentally prepare that I'm not going to get on this flight and try and make plans for otherwise. Um, but I, I agree with you. I really don't know um, what it does for like the you and me's of the world as far well, as the guys who would still be there at the airport, regardless of the 80% confidence interval. I am curious though, if anyone's listening who would look at an 80% uh, you know, confidence that this flight's going to get canceled and rebook, I want to hear from you. Like what, what kind of thing is going through your head in that mind? Like, or do you just not want to put up with the even chance of it? I don't know. Write us human factors, cast at gmail.com. Join us on our Slack. Uh, we want to hear from you. Um, okay, Blake, well, why don't we get into our next story here? All right. So what if you could look down and see your actual arms and legs inside of VR or look at other real world people or objects as if you weren't wearing a headset? Well, the team at inverse spent the last five years building this kind of incredible technology at the Swiss Federal Institute of Tech, and now its real-time mixed reality engine is ready for public demos, debuting at the Sundance Film Festival uh, this year. So Immersive Inverse's tech has the power to make VR seem much more believable and easy to adjust, which is critical as the industry tries to grow headset ownership among mainstream buyers. So, Nick, we've often talked about this kind of problem with VR headsets, right? So you, you're you very immersed in what's going on inside the headset, but let's say your phone rings. How does that interaction really go? Are you lifting up the headset? How do you know that your phone's ringing or any of that kind of stuff? So this seems like a pretty cool technology, but it's it. I don't understand necessarily how it works together with i guess what's going on in the actual vr experience and then how it's tying data for what's going on in the real world together sure so i think that's a little bit further down the line here but i think what they're doing this looks really bad let me just say that this looks really bad but i'm glad that somebody's working on this because this is this is a problem that i don't think a lot of people actually think of right so when you're in a vr environment um and you look down at your avatar sometimes you have an avatar, sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's just air below you, and it's really kind of disorienting that you're this disembodied head that's floating around the space. Um, and even when there is an avatar, it's not a one-for-one -one mapping with your body. Uh, and that's also disorienting, right? So I'm thinking, uh, think about the example of, like, Eve uh, Valkyrie, the, the VR space shooter game, right? You're in a cockpit, you look down, and you see this really athletic... Uh, built pilot's body uh, that is probably not most of us, right? Or, or a male's body if you're female, or a female's body if you're male. It's just something that doesn't match up to who you are physically. Uh, so that's one extra layer of disbelief that you have to sort of get over if you want to believe that you're in this virtual environment. And another piece is that when you map um, these... When you map... Um, control schemes to the avatar's motions that don't match your own motion, right? So a lot of times in these games or these uh, virtual experiences, you'll have disembodied hands that are separated from your, uh, your body because it doesn't know how your arm is actually moving. All it knows is the position of your hands. It can try to 
to uh, figure it out, but it doesn't know for sure, right? Because you could like hold out your arm in front of you to where your elbow's bent. Now move your elbow, but keep your hands stationary. Like that is the kind of thing that VR doesn't know right now because of the tracking methods. With something like this, you are actually seeing your physical body in the virtual environment, and that just uh, sort of increases the ownership that you have in that environment. I think the interaction techniques will come later, but I think this is a good step for getting around that whole um, personifying an avatar, if you will. Uh, we don't we don't necessarily do that all the time, and sometimes it can be hard to do do or hard to sort of get over that wall if you don't see the avatar as someone relatable um i mean who wouldn't want a heroic superhero body but like if, if it doesn't match you then you can disconnect yourself from it a little bit and i can see this being useful for um especially we've talked about before in the past things like uh the virtual surgery i think we brought that up on the show a couple of weeks ago but but actually being able to see um like uh, your physical body in a virtual space. Uh, so that way you can see what your hands are doing um, to a projected virtual um, patient or, or something along those lines. You know, it, it gives you that much more control over the virtual environment. And that's where I think this really shines. Yeah, most definitely. And I think uh, too, they like, they mentioned in the article um, basically what, inverse calls live maker but it's kind of like a photoshop for vr and i i think this is a great application for that for in in this case they really only show basically the controller in your hand that you're manipulating your environment with or you're that you're using the set of like photoshop like tools with but at least giving you almost kind of some pencil you can look at while you're drawing it's not exactly the same concept you're talking about of creating a more immersive experience by showing them an avatar that's much more mapped to them but i, f I feel like the, there is a lot to be said for the idea of having virtual tools in um, jobs like architecture or even like uh, UI and UX design in the office, like being able to really create these virtual worlds and what those tools look like to to build them using a headset and an actual like pair of uh, controllers is is a really cool idea. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this it'll be cool to see where this technology goes for sure. I'm I'm excited by it, even though like I, I don't want to. I started this off by saying this looks bad. It looks bad in the rendering sense, not in the like, oh my God, this is a piece of technology that is happening sense uh, because that part of it is really cool. Um, I mean, if you see the video, you'll know what I mean. There's, there's like issues with actually seeing your, like it digitizes. It. It's weird, but it is really cool. So um, before we get into our last story, do you have any closing thoughts on this one, Blake? I don't, Nick. You broke it down really well for everybody. Okay. Well, uh, before we move on to our next story, our last story of the week, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Engadget, TechCrunch, Gizmodo uh, for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, we post those in our social media and in our Slack as we find them. So go ahead and join us on Slack and, and get the head start on our new stories of the week. What do we got up next, Blake? This one's a big one. Yeah, this one is a big one. We got a lot of interaction in our Slack about it, so it'll be fun to talk about. So smartphones, app, Strava, and Fitbits are used worldwide to track how far people's exercise, such as running, go. So researchers recently discovered that in an anonymized data dump released by Strava last year, that, that it accidentally revealed sensitive locations, including U.S. military bases around the world. Oops. The, yeah, the user data was released in November of as a 2017 heat map showing over 1 billion activities, including 13 trillion GPS data points. That includes where and how fast people went for a jog, for, for instance. And if you look closely, something like airfields in Somalia that made house American special forces suddenly light up like Christmas trees. It's a great reminder that virtually every single piece of technology, every single technology company has an enormous trove of data that can be used in a myriad of ways, even if they're not intended this way. So Nick, this, this one really kind of blew me away because I never thought that based off of, you know, just some an anonymized data dump, and I'm sure the people at Strava felt the same way, they were going to reveal so much information about just where people were in the world. 
Yeah, I don't even know where to start for this. Um, so let me just kind of recap what you said here in that basically what what they had was this heat map and uh, it was a heat map of user data uh, tagged with um, geolocation. Now, the problem with this is that when you have a whole lot of nothing, right, like in, in Somalia, where you have a whole lot of space where there shouldn't be people and you see it light up like a Christmas tree, then that would indicate to somebody that there are people there that are uploading data uh, to this service. And that is how now all these air bases and military bases are being found. Um, And it's not like the U.S. military is completely oblivious to this. I mean, before you go into secret and top secret spaces, they you have to remove all digital devices, right? You have to remove your Fitbits. You have to remove your cell phones. You have to, anything that has some sort of connection, USB devices, you have to remove everything. So it's not like they're not being careful. It's just that outside of secret spaces, it's not something that you really think about. And this has huge implications for governmental uh, policy and procedure. Will we now start to see where you can't take your Fitbit with you or anything that transmits data with you uh, while you're on deployment or, um, you know, while you're visiting one of these bases that you don't like want to sort of relay information about. So there is that problem too. And, uh, but more importantly, I, I, I don't know if it's more important. Like there's, there's just so much stuff with this, right? Like I don't even know where to start. So that's one thing. Um, and that's a really big one too, because I mean, it, it's, it's tough, right? Cause you don't even, if somebody being deployed, it might be one of the things that you kind of enjoy being able to understand like how, how long did I jog? How much exercise did I get throughout the day? But I mean, the, the danger here is it's, it basically is calculating distance that you are walking or how far you've gone from a specific point. So it could, it could put you in real danger, uh, depending on if somebody was Tino. I mean, this is from a, uh, like an anonymized data dump, right? Well, what if since this information is available, people start trying to hack Strava's infrastructure and then you you get a real into real sketchy kind of places then. Sure. Sure. And I mean, you, you brought up some of the conversation from our Slack. Did you want to jump into that? Yeah, we can do that. All right, go ahead. Let me (laughs) hop on up there. Uh, So one of the, one of our guys in Slack, who's always chatting with us, Brian actually kind of drop some information about the Strava story. So I'm just going to read some of his bit and then Nick, I'll let you drop into your reply if you'd like. Oh, sure. Um, So Brian, Brian writes that the Strava story is a crazy story that pretty much was just waiting to happen. You can identify people and even track them from track them home. Uh, At Zynep on Twitter had a really good thought on this Uh, quote. Can, can give people can, (laughs) can people give informed consent to be tracked? And the whole thread is good, but the main point was that, quote, privacy of data simply cannot be negotiated person by person, especially because there's no meaningful informed consent. People cannot comprehend that their data will reveal, especially in conjunction with other data, and even companies do not know do not know this so they can't inform anyone which is a really interesting point that brian makes here about how how are we really giving our informed consent when one we don't know how data can potentially be used or cross-pollinated and neither do these companies well for, based on the article that we posted a lot of the way that strava strava was handling this unfortunately in my opinion was you you should have read the informed consent stuff that we make you basically say yes to to use our use our application yeah but Um, even even that blake so even that doesn't cover the kind of things that brian's talking about here and this is kind of included in my reply uh basically i i go in to talk about consent being a big issue with some of these things, especially, I don't know if you saw, I I was like really close to putting the story in our show notes, uh, but I decided against it. But now people are using AI and neural networks to map celebrity faces to porn. Right. And yeah. And think about this. So the, 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 the celebrities have no consent over this. Now this is, this is using AI. So it doesn't stop at just celebrities. You can, People have access to your Facebook, so you can put potentially ex-girlfriends or ex-boyfriends and even worse, children 
on these things without their consent and map them onto images that are not the pornographic images like this is crazy and this is the kind of thing that facebook couldn't have even imagined when they when they wrote their informed consent to post things on their facebook site right like yeah post your images it's going to be available on the internet that's all we can say what people do with it we don't know but to say like this is such a huge stretch of the imagination i know we're getting off a little bit on a tangent from the from the strava story but it's a really interesting conversation that i want to have because it's it's crazy to me that we can do this yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's even getting that far away from it, Nick. I mean, I think it's an important point because this, the, I mean, even the last line that Brian leaves is uh, from the guy he's quoting is even the companies really don't know what this information can be used to do. And your Facebook example is a is a perfect one. I mean, guys that have worked there previously, we've talked about it on the show, they they were completely blown away by the addictive nature of what of the software they created or the experience they created which wasn't the intent in the first place, but that's what resulted. And I mean, we're talking a lot about in the past couple of weeks, the development of smart cities where more, uh, more surveillance equipment is being incorporated into your everyday life. Well, now we're getting beyond just having pictures of you, but now we have some of your movements, what you walk like, what your gait yeah. looks like. And now you're talking about not even, I mean, porn's bad, but think if somebody was able to manipulate you doing some kind of crime yeah, and um, using AI and neural networks. I mean, it gets, it gets just to be a very, very big snowball effect to me. It's, it's this v- really strange dichotomy between the beauty of having all this information in our fingertips and then the danger of having all this information at everybody's fingertips. Yeah. And while we're deep down this rabbit hole, I mean, we've already talked about this whole, uh, manipulating somebody else. Um, to do your bidding, right? We ha- we've seen on the show even, we had that story about the researchers who were able to recreate politicians' voices from sound clips um, and have facial animations that match those that look realistic. So now we can have people do and say things that they are not actually doing. And we are living in now this like dystopian future where the technology is really exciting, but it's also really scary with what, what sort of implications you can... Uh, do with it and man if that's not a way to sign off i don't know what is <laughs> yeah i know i wrapped it up with a bummer and i didn't even realize it because i didn't know where we would go with it but yeah it's it's uh definitely be careful where you take your fitbit kids yeah that's moral of the story hey uh listeners we are going to skip it came from reddit this week just because my voice like i said it's going to be a shorter episode so that's going to be it for today you like that that was a good transition Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Let us know. Are you sad we're not doing it came from Reddit? I am. I like that part of the show. But let us know. You can hit us up all over our social media. Uh, Join us on our Slack. Like I said, our discussion is blowing up on there. So lots of of good voices over there to be heard. Uh, Or you can head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Uh, You can check us out on SoundCloud. Leave us a comment over there if you'd like to engage with us. Or you can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can also support us on Patreon if you want to do so financially. We always love that at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Uh, If you don't want to support us financially, it's okay. I understand. Money's tight. What you can do instead is you can go like, subscribe, review us on whatever your favorite podcast directory is. Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, you name it. As long as you leave us a review and make it good, we love it. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Armstrong, thank you for hanging out with me and dealing with my sickness and being flexible and everything and just being the most wonderful co-host ever. Where can our listeners find you if they want to talk about potentially putting your face on porn? Oh, yeah. You guys can always find me at Don't Panic UX on Twitter and across social media. And Nick, thank you for doing this on the Tuesday night. I know you were sick, but I had a great time. All right, great. I had a great time, too. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. You can talk to me about being sick and NyQuil ads. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It depends. Where's my NyQuil?